Thank you for joining us for day four of the HS Awareness Week Virtual Summit. I am your host, Jasmine Ivana Espy, and today we are talking about caregiving for HS patients. This is going to be a great conversation because I know that a lot of families and friends and significant others are sometimes hit along with patients with the burden of chronic illness and disease. So I thought it would be amazing to bring on some caregivers who are caregiving for, for patients who are younger and older um, and to provide some tips about what it's like to caregive for HS patients and just provide some guidance um, to that role because I think it's extremely important and not a lot of patients um, have solid support. However, for the ones that do or the ones that want to build and cultivate that for themselves, that is what this conversation is for, is so that we can provide you with the tools to ask for that from your friends, ask from that for that from your family, and to speak specifically about what you need from them and how to show up. Because that's always how you get people to show up for you, is talking about specifics, okay? So before we get started, of course I want to thank the amazing sponsors that made this summit happen. Thank you so much to the Hydronitis Superativa Foundation, the Mama IU, Hydraware 100 page journals, designs by Muriel, HS Connects, Hope for HS, and Sugar Lovin'. Thank you so much for making this happen for the HS community. We, deep you, we deeply appreciate you um, from the bottom of our hearts from My Gold Lining Incorporated. Thank you. Right now, we are going to dive into this amazing conversation that we have with these two amazing um, caregivers for HS patients. We have my mother, Muriel Espy, and then we also have Ani, who is a caregiver as well. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. I'm Muriel Espy and I am Jasmine's mom. And I actually uh, was an instructional designer for about 20 years. And right now I am um, a jewelry artisan. So I have designs by Muriel. And uh, these are actually the earrings that you're going to get <laughs> as a giveaway. But um, I've been working with Jasmine for about 16 years um, as a caregiver and uh, a caregiver in, a, in um, maybe a different way than, than some other people you know, have to do. We're, we're going to talk about that. Yeah. yeah. Good evening. Um, you can call me um, Ane. And I have been a caregiver for four to five years. I guess as a parent, we've been a, been a caregiver as long as our, our children have been alive. But specifically for this conversation tonight, um, that's about the length of time. But I have been a health and wellness advocate um, and um, someone that's very much into holistic health care for most of my life, remembering as a child taking cayenne pepper peels, you know, when I had a cold. And so that's been a part of our, of our family. So I'm looking forward to sharing a lot of things along those lines. Absolutely, absolutely. So diving into the conversation, I want to start by helping the audience to understand um, what roles you played in the HS patients that you care uh, gave for or you're caregiving for currently. Um, what was that role and what did that look like? Um, uh, we can start with you, Anne. Well, I would have to say I was um, or have been instrumental in all aspects of care except self-care. Uh, you know, when I say self-care, we talk we usually talk about our own self. But what I mean is my child's self-care, meaning direct application of for wound care. That's the only aspect that I wasn't directly involved with. But everything else, I've been fully. Um, integrated with making decisions and food supplements and all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Muriel? So um, my role has been more a role of um, working with emotional uh, assistance, um, listening, uh, listening to hear, and then out of listening to hear, 
uh, developing empathy so that I am understanding the feelings that, you know, one has with HS because it's a lot more than I just, I have a wound or that it's even hurting, but, you know, pain management, um, I've been working with trying to find ways, you know, uh, assist so that we could manage the pain so that you could manage the pain. And so uh, that has been more of my function. Also, uh, moon care. So we had an extensive um, period of time where we were working with the wounds and, you know, trying to make them heal. So um, I think I'm more of the emotional um, part of it, but the emotional part is really, really um, heavy. It's a lot going on. And uh, I think people miss that. Uh, a lot of times, anyone with a chronic illness, um, people can, can't understand how that person is feeling unless you have the chronic illness. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I understand as much as I can, but that's where all the listening comes in. Because if I'm listening very hard and I'm trying to understand what's going on, then I automatically you know, I'm feeling some of the things that, you know, the, the person is feeling, you know, that has the HS to HS patient. So that is probably my biggest role. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that actually reminds me that, um, you know, there were, there was a moment even, you know, talking about the emotional support, kind of like playing off of what you just said, there was a moment that I remember when I was young, well, not young, um, this was when I had my first CO2, um, and I was sitting on the, the, the chair with my arm up and all of my arm was exposed. All of this was gone. All of it was gone. And this was like fresh. This was the first CO2 laser treatment I had. And this was like fresh, like I think the, the second day, I think that we had the surgery. And so I looked at my mom because I was completely like, I was completely unclothed. And I was like, how can you look at this? And care for this? How could you not be like squeamish and afraid and nauseous or, you know? And so I wanted, I want you to speak to that both uh, Muriel and Ana. If I know that you said that you don't, you didn't, you weren't directly involved with wound care. Um, but if there is an aspect of wound care that you could speak to, that would be great. Uh, but Muriel, I would love for you to, 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 to speak to that. How do you show up for an HS patient when you're dealing with open wounds, surgery, blood, pus, things of that nature? It's, it's a lot to take in. Um, that's a really good question. Um, and in the beginning, I'm one of those people who did not feel that I could be a caregiver, you know, besides just taking care of my children. But I didn't think, and in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, well, that's a nurse, you know, a nurse is doing all these different things. And I thought, oh, I can't do that. I'm not good at that. It scared me because I didn't want to do anything wrong, you know, mess anybody up. And so that's kind of how I felt. But when you have someone that you care about, you just simply have to step up. And that's really what I had to do. I had to make the decision that whatever needs to be done, I'm going to have to participate and, and get it done. And so in my mind, you know, I had to put the fear to the side and decide that I'm going to be there. And so what I did, and, I, and I'm not really all that squeamish, um, but it is shocking to see some of the wounds. So the first thing I thought is don't show any emotion besides, you know, I'm here to help you, you know, no matter what I was thinking, you know because I'm thinking this, this is my child and you know, this is something I would never want you know, to inflict on anybody, let alone you know, my, my child. So I just decided, okay, what do we have to do? So you make the decisions, you make the plans, you decide how it's gonna flow, you know, how am I gonna learn this? And so listen to the doctors, make sure that you know, we're working together, you know, be pleasant and we get it done. And so, uh, it just was a, a, a decision, you know, to make and making sure that I understood how all the, the wound care worked. So, and, and the love that I have, you know, and, and when you have people that you care about that have HS, that love takes over. So you move into a place of whatever I can do to help you, whatever I can do to assist you. And even 
to the point of looking up information and keeping myself educated on like what's going on in this area and you know am I doing this right or making sure I check with the doctor to make sure that I'm um, putting everything in place because I remember there were you had to put the the gauze on the Vaseline on the you had to do things in a certain order you know so I just wanted to make sure I was doing everything correctly but um, the love I have um, overcame the fear of not doing it right or not being able to be a, a caregiver, you know, and really caregiving is, is not always all the nurse, you know, thinking about what all the nurse does. Um, caregiving is really in the simplest terms, providing um, care for a person who needs extra help. So in HS, there's extra help and there are things that you're gonna to need to do that may not be on the list of what you would do with someone who is you know, much older or someone who has another chronic disease, but extra help. So where is it that I need to provide that extra help? So that's, that's why I would say. Um, and I just wanna say, as we go along, I'm gonna, if I'm looking, I'm jotting some notes so I don't remember uh, I mean, I don't forget some things that I want to say. Um, so I'm not distracted. I'm, I'm fully in tune of everything. Um, so I, I, I think about, um, so not having to apply uh, ointments and, and bandages is the only thing that I would say that I didn't do, but making decisions about what treatment options are we going to use? What, what, um, that we're going to try our best to be holistic in how we treat the skin, um, having some um, knowledge about essential oils um, and the properties of different, different oils. Um, laundry, um, you know, that can be quite an embarrassing area, um, especially when you're, you, I, I mean, for anyone, but when you're talking about um, your child who, you know, it, it's different to adults. Um, at times, you know, not now, you know, you're dealing with an adult compared to dealing with a child who may feel shy and sharing certain things or embarrassed. And so um, similar to what uh, Muriel was saying in regards to not um, not showing certain expressions on your face or even internally thinking, oh, that's nasty or things like that. No, this is just a part of um, the life that that's being lived and it needs to be just as natural um, as any as any aspect of laundry but let's make sure we're we're uh, doing um, 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 stain stain removing and you know so um, but without it being an embarrassing topic let's be able to you know making sure that I could talk about things it's supposed as opposed to sweeping them under the rug and trying to hide it so as to as a as a way to make my child feel comfortable let's be open about it I talked about it as just like any regular thing you know your socks are are dingy let's let's get some whitener you know so I was sure not to make it seem like it was uh, something to be ashamed of. Um, and, you know, and then the teaching aspect of, okay, well, you can't just leave these, you know, in, in the laundry basket in the, in the room for however long or whatever. So just being open to talk about those things as, as just as natural as whatever and teaching how to do self-care, not just on the body, but just, you know, all aspects of what wound care requires. Um, you know, oftentimes I would ask, okay, I may see my child maybe walking a certain way or something like that and say, okay, do you have an active flare? Uh, no, or yes, you know, I'll get a response and say, oh, well, do you, do you need a heat pack? Or so I was constantly involved in wound care in that aspect or making sure different bandages weren't run out of and I was uh, reordering things or, or trying something new. Or, or different things like that. And, um, and when you speak about, Muriel, when you spoke about being, not being a nurse, there were some times where uh, I personally had to fill in, for example, um, my child had a pick line uh, before surgery to get a heavy dose of, I guess their antibiotics or whatever to bring the inflammation and things down so that the healing process may go a little bit better afterwards or to clear out some more bacteria just in case. And so I was being put in charge after shown, being shown one time of how to continually do a pick line. And I told them, 
don't leave me with this. Like I am not competent. I mean, I don't feel comfortable, um, you know, and that's, that's an as aspect of that that will probably get into later of myself needing care with poor memory and things like that. So I had to balance between knowing how to push and, and figure it out or what I can do and saying, I need support here. I can't do this completely by myself. And within this, I want to say that it is difficult to ask for help. When, for example, when I was a teenager, I got H. Well, no, I was 11, I was not a teenager. I was 11 years old when I got it. And it was difficult to really process what I was dealing with. Yesterday, I remembered a time that I went over one of my mother's friend's houses to spend the night. And we went to a buffet and I had to use the restroom. When I went to the restroom, I, cause I was 350 pounds at the time. So I was lifting up my stomach skin and there was blood everywhere. And I was out in public and I had no emotional support. I had no one to talk to. All I shed a few tears. I sucked my sucked it up in my chest. I wiped it off and I left and went back. That is not the way that I wish I would have done that. I wish I could have articulated how I felt. I wish I would have had someone there to speak about the experience I was going through. And I think that for HS patients, it's difficult sometimes for us to speak up and to really articulate how we're feeling. And I think a part of that is because we, sometimes we can disassociate from the experience to protect ourselves. Um, I did that for majority of the time that I've had HS. So out of the 16 years that I've had HS, 15 of those years I've disassociated. <laughs> so this is like really the first year that I've been present really in my body and been very intentional about what I do, who I am and healing myself and healing others. And so I encourage HS patients to just gauge who in your family can show up for you in the way that you need to and your friends, because not everyone is going to be able to. And sometimes we can hurt ourselves by depending on people who, are, who can't show up. Um, so discernment is, is key. And I know that you're probably thinking, how do I discern that? Um, I was talking to Erin Martinez, who is a therapist uh, for HS patients, and she's just a social worker. Um, in general, she deals with a lot of trauma um, and you know, childhood therapy and things of that nature. And one of the things she said was to test that individual with something that is less vulnerable. So for an example, um, you don't have to say this, but you can say, girl, I just got my period today and da -da 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 -da. like, you know what I mean? Or you can tell your guys, whatever a guy thing, you know what I mean? That is not so serious um, to see how they react, how they gauge the information you're telling them. And then you can kind of from there sort of judge how they may take something even that's heavier than that. Um, and I think, in that, um, and sort of wrapping up this point, too, is, is that when you tell someone, hey, I have this condition um, and I would love support, speaking to how you want support is helpful as well. Because some people, you know, caregiving for HS, it, there's a lot involved. So speaking to the specifics. So it's like, I need, I just need someone here physically with me as support, that's it. I don't need you to say anything. I don't need you to do anything, just be here. It could be somebody who is coming to you with you to doctor's appointments. Um, someone who can help to rem remind you, hey, make sure you ask this question. Make sure you do this, you know, X, Y, and Z and things like that. So moving to the next question that I actually have, I wanna talk about some of the challenges that arise for caregivers when dealing with HS patients. And I also want to encourage attendees, if you have any questions about caregiving for HS patients or questions about how to ask somebody to show up for you as a caregiver, please use the Q&A or the chat function that are at, it's at the bottom of your screen um, and enter in your questions. And we are going to answer those throughout. And there's a, a section at the end that we're gonna uh, talk about this as well. Um, so I want to go into the challenges that arise 
for caregivers when dealing with HS patients. And I know we talked a little bit about this in that there's a lot of research that has to be done. And then also there are some tasks that you get involved with that are way out of your reach um, and that actually need a medical professional. So can you speak to some of those experiences? Um, Anae, you can, you can start if you would like. And can you repeat the question just so I make sure I yeah, absolutely. Grasp. So, well, I'm just wondering what are some of the challenges that arose um, while caring for um, your child with HS? Um, I, I think the biggest thing that I think of that I would call the biggest mistake that I made, um, I say it's a mistake because in hindsight, it, you know, you always say, if I knew this, I would have done this differently. But um, I say a mistake, but also I wasn't educated as educated as I am now, or I was barely educated at the time. And I was relying on the medical professionals to steer me and guide me. Um, and so the, what, the thing I'm speaking to is staying on, allowing my child to stay on antibiotics, several variety of antibiotics over a period of time, um, ultimately, it ended up being rifampin and um, clind uh, doxycycline um, for, but antibiotics for a very long time. First, it was with the uh, pediatrician. And um, at that point, HS wasn't diagnosed yet. Um, and so we tried a variety of things. And I, I, I do believe it was a mistake that I didn't say, okay, this is going on long enough. This isn't working. We need to reach out and find a dermatologist or whoever it is that we need to see to dig a little bit deeper to find out what's going on. I would say that is a mistake, um, but my ignorance or um, I'll just leave it like that um, of allowing the antibiotics to be used for so long. And I think that there are some repercussions that are still now with some digestive issues, even though we did probiotics most of the time and, and, and all of that, you know, and trying to heal the gut. But I would say, um, that was the biggest huge mistake that was made. Mm -hmm. But but I would say that once I once we did get to the dermatologist and uh, thank God they she diagnosed it very quickly. That's when I dug into the research and I took the healthcare or my child's healthcare into my own hands. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Muriel. Um. When Arne is talking about that, it, it just reminded me of the beginning of our journey where we were going to physicians and they were telling us that all these different things were wrong. And, and um, I can't remember the first diagnosis, but it was a very frightening diagnosis. That's what I remember because I remember really praying hard that uh, they said it was some small percentage that she wouldn't develop into some terrible condition and I said, well, Lord, if that's the percentage, then um, we want to be in the percentage where she does not go into that direction. But um, it was a rare blood disorder, actually. Yes, yes, you're right. You're right. Yeah. And um, we actually, I, I'm not going to say happened, not, I believe God sent us this way, but I worked for a healthcare organization. And in that organization, they sent emails all the time. And um, the emails gave you information of just about things all over that apply to what we were doing. And I never look at them. I never look at them because I'm too busy. <laughs> so I was like, I'm too busy to look at that. And for some reason, I looked at this one. And so I read about a clinical trial and I was like, hmm. And so I'm reading and reading and it sounds just like what Jasmine's going through, but it said dermatology. The other doctors weren't saying anything about dermatology but my daughter said something about it. And so I said, wait, wait, maybe it is this. And come to find out that it was, it was an HS um, clinical trial. And that got us with some of the best doctors, you know, in that field. So um, that was just a blessing, but so many HS patients are going through uh, trying to figure out what's wrong. And that's how all the, the shame develops because they're saying, well, you need to clean. Well, you know, they're boils. Where are you doing that? All these different things. And it just, it's, it's just a, it's a terrible way to go. But I can say that being um, 
and finding the medical advocate and then making sure that you're, someone is there with an HS patient because they're getting information and they're trying to break through all these different feelings. They're feeling a certain way, they're hurting, they don't know what's going on. Somebody's saying, well, you can't get rid of it. And it's all these things are going, so somebody needs to be there too to advocate for the HS patient in that I'm listening, I'm taking notes, um, I'm doing, I'm, I'm uh, educating myself uh, so that the two of us can talk again about what's going on, you know, and, and try to decide, okay, where are we going next? Because it's all, it's a journey for the HS patient and the caregiver. We're both learning. We're both going along trying to figure out well, what, what's happening here, you know, and I spent more time um, with Jasmine uh, as a more of a, an adult or, or a person that could do for herself. But even in that time, um, we just were trying our best to find out what the best step is, listening to the doctors and, um, and reading and getting as much information as possible. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to kind of go back a little bit because um, that's why it's, it's really important to have someone in the office with you specifically for that because with HS patients um, and it's somebody who's knowledgeable as well because there'll be doctors who will say oh you're fat and that's the reason why you have HS oh you sm you're a smoker and that's why you have HS and if you have someone who's there to support you they're, even though they are emotionally distressed, probably shocked by what they were saying, they could probably intervene more than you can. Um, and so I'm not saying that every time, because I know sometimes it might be difficult to have someone come every single time, but um, on the more important appointments, I think it's important to have someone there um, that can really advocate and speak for you when you can't speak for yourself, especially in those moments where doctors say things like that. And you can, you know, that person can combat it with, well, I read this online um, about this and that I, the study says something completely different. So can you talk about that? You know, so really, I, th I believe in challenging doctors, um, especially when they're spewing ignorance. And I think that it's important to have someone there who can also help you and support you through that. Because as I think many of us may know, dealing with doctors with HS can be very difficult and uh, it can be sort of like talking to and working with a brick wall, to be truthfully honest. Um, so moving through that, um, how do you, as an HS caregiver, show up and deal with the emotional weight of seeing your child, your loved one, your significant other with such a debilitating condition? What is the emotional um, healing that you've had to do or have you even gone down that road? Do you have any tips for caregivers who are in that same position? Um, Muriel, you can speak to that if you would like. Okay. Um, so I'm going to say that it is very challenging for caregivers when you care about somebody and you see them in this kind of pain. It's, um, it's a lot. Uh, empathy is, you know, understanding the feelings of somebody else. But when you love somebody and you're, and you're understanding the feelings, then you kind of get a little bit emotional too. I'm going to say a lot of emotion goes in there. Um, I, of course, um, pray and I'm asking, you know, God to show me what I can do, where I can go, you know, how we can get healing. But um, the way I feel emotionally is that, I, I wish it was not something that, you know, my daughter would have to deal with. Uh, so you just really have to try to encourage yourself, um, stay close. You know, I always want to be close. I want to always want to make, you want to make sure an HS patient knows that you are available for them when they need you. Because there could be times they need you where you, you know, you're thinking, oh, I don't feel like talking or I know that, you know, she's going to talk about this or, but then you need to be there. You need to be there and listening. Just recently, I'd say in the last year, 
uh, just talking with Jasmine, she told me something that hadn't clicked before that day. And she said, uh, every day, almost every moment, I think of HS, the fact that I have it. And so it kind of blew me away because I thought it was more when you have an outbreak or more when I, you know, just start thinking about it really hard or, you know, when I just feel depressed. So that didn't always happen. That didn't happen in, at least when we were talking to each other, it didn't happen all the time. So I would just think that that's when she would think about it and she'd have, you know, a, a, a emotional response and then she'd need somebody to talk to and there I am. But it is, it is every day, every moment, every time you're looking in an area, every time you go into the restroom, every time. And I didn't, I didn't understand that. So once I understood that, I just thought, wow, um, that's a lot to deal with. And, and I've had, my whole family's had a chronic illness of some sort at some time. So um, I'm learning to be available and not be hard on myself if I make a mistake, but try to do the best I can when they need me. Because, you know, sometimes, you know, people are getting emotional and they're, they're feeling like maybe you didn't show up for them in the time that they needed you to show up. Mm -hmm. And so you have to forgive yourself and find out how you can do better next time. And that is really, uh, it's a very human thing. We all make mistakes, we all do wrong, we all you know, mess up, but um, because she's going through so much, because HS patients are going through so much, uh, you wanna be there so that you can do whatever is necessary to help. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, um, I wanted to mention to you because <laughs> that, I feel like that moment is, I feel it, it's very, I think it's pivotal to the whole HS experience because when doctors, physicians, anyone who doesn't have HS and looks at HS patients, they're not thinking that we're dealing with this at every aspect of our life, you know, every point um, of our life from, you know, not being, being restricted to, from activities, you know, us that are dealing with diet and food, you know, restricting in that area, um, restrictions in work life and social life in, you know, sexual habits, things of that nature, all of these things have an impact and having someone who is by your side and can speak for you um, is helpful. But I know that also it's difficult to be able to show up for patients um, and, and deal with that, that emotional weight. Um, so Anae, I wanted to give you an opportunity to speak to this as well. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that I have some insight about is being in chronic pain. That's something that I deal with regularly. So I think that it gives me a little bit insight to know that there's similar to what Muriel um, discovered is that there is a constant awareness um, that it may be, you may feel a flare about to happen and there may be some pain. It may not be a full flare yet and, um, or the anxiety or, uh, or, or fear of it happening and you have something, spe a special event coming up or something like that. And so I'm just mindful that dealing with chronic pain or a chronic condition there is a lot of um, things that goes on behind closed, behind closed doors, behind the clothes that the person never speaks to, never shares that they're preoccupied with or that they're feeling a certain way and not telling anyone. So I try to be mindful of that, um, that that could be happening even though I'm not aware of it. Um, and uh, thinking ahead in something I just mentioned about maybe there's a special occasion coming up and um, so I, I try to be supportive and say, you know, let's, let's, you know, try to stick to your food plan because, you know, I know you want to be healthy for that particular occasion and you want to fully enjoy it, but without making um, my child feel guilty because there is that, you know, that battle with food where you do want to 
you do want to indulge in certain things because just like all of us, we have cravings or whatever, and you don't want to feel guilty because you're already going through your own emotional, mental things about maybe not feeling like you're doing what you're supposed to be doing to take care of yourself, but then wanting to indulge and in feeling uh, limited or inhibited to enjoy certain certain pleasures of life that you used to. Um, and so trying to find a balance with that um, and um, and then not saying anything when it is that special occasion and, and there's some indulgence um, and not putting that extra emotional stress um, in that situation. Um, also making opportunities for self-care. Um, and I say making opportunities for self-care in regards to providing space to for privacy. Um, not only but being a parent where I'm fully invested and involved in the medical aspect of care and making decisions, but at the same time, there's exams. Um, there's maybe some things privately that you don't want to discuss um, about your most intimate areas with your parent in the room and respecting that um, enough to say, I understand that I'm an parent, but at the same time, I understand and respect the privacy of this is not my body. And um, I don't feel like I have a full right to, to look at everything and see everything just because it's my child. Um, and then, um, so the self-care in that way and opportunities for self-care to just enjoy, to just not have to think about the stressors of life, including caring for um, your own body. So just uh, opportunities for just hanging out with friends where I may allow some extra time because I know things have kind of been heavy. So I mean, self-care in that way, um, where um, you know I sacrifice my time or whatever it is so that my child can have mm -hmm. these opportunities for self-care. What it looks like for a young person is not necessarily what it would look like for me, but understanding and respecting that. And then um, advocating with other people where I'm sharing parenting. So advocating for my child with the other parent to say, okay, this is serious. You need to provide support in this way. Um, you know, here's here's food options. Here, here's how I can support you to support our child. Um, so that either way it gets done and my child is supported. Um, so advocating uh, with other people who help in the care of, of my child. And I would say the last thing is providing opportunities to say more or say less. So for example, where we have camp coming up. So we had to talk to the dietitian and the camp, the camp director and the medical um, head and we had, we had a, a big meeting. And so there are certain questions that were asked about the condition or about the care. And I would look at my child and kind of get the direction uh, or you know, a, allow, not, not take over that conversation because what I may say too little or I may say too much. And so I, I let that be led by my child, those conversations. How old is your child? Are you open to disclosing that information? Uh, a teenager. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, that, that's perfect. Um, that's a perfect segue into um, us kind of talking about how, what being a caregiver has taught you personally. So not necessarily in relation to the HS experience, but has it taught you anything personally, just, I guess, uh, regarding like showing up for someone else and just being selfless in that capacity? Well, um, I would say that for me, it's made me much more aware of somebody else uh, and how they feel and even if I don't, if, if a patient feels or someone with chronic disease or illness feels, um, feels bad or feels like I've done something that wasn't right or felt like I didn't you know, show up the way I should have in a situation, um, no matter what I think about it, the way they feel about it is very important if they're important to me. So I've learned that Sometimes I need to give up, you know, saying, well, I did this and I did that and I thought this and that and just say, you know what, babe, I'm sorry. I, I, I should have been there. 
you know, because we always want to fight for, you know, if we're right. And, you know, it, it's just, it's hard. When you have a chronic illness, it's hard and you need somebody. And like I said earlier, we all miss it. But I think that's what I have learned most of all is to say, I'm sorry, try to do better the next time and, um, and really care about that person. Put Muriel to the side and you know, what, what do you need? Um, and so that I think is the most important lesson for me. Mm -hmm. Ana, do you have anything to add to this part? Well, the first, the first thing that, 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 that jumps out, um, and I guess I'll bring it back around is that uh, recently my child said, um, shared that there was a variety of stressors and um, I knew some of them just because you know, you're doing life together, but you're not thinking about it as a accumulation of a whole basket of stressors. You're just seeing, okay, well that happened, that's over. That happened, that's over. That happened, that's over. You know, I don't see any HS flares. So, you know, my mind's not on that. I'm not thinking, which really actually kind of a little bit goes back that um, I did learn to be more aware of that. However, I don't think that I always keep it as uh, present in the forefront of my mind. And it's not even so much physically what's being dealt with. It's the loss, the loss. And that's what I was hearing in the theme, the loss of people, the loss of freedom, the loss of enjoyment, the loss of, um, and so it is, it, it kind of grounded me to be, uh, to keep it more in the forefront of my mind about the cumulative stressors. And this is just one of the many things that that is a stressor. Um, I didn't expect on the list to be the loss of enjoyment of food. Um, you know, well, I can't, you know, I got to worry about what I can't eat or what I can, can eat. And my child has been very disciplined um, pretty quickly with the, the AIP um, food plan. And so in my mind, it didn't seem like a stressor. Um, so I guess, I, I, I think, you know, even just talking about talking it out loud right now, I think what I need to learn from that is that to carve out specific time to sit down and talk as opposed to waiting for something to happen and then it's just bubbling out and you're getting little bits and pieces. So you actually asking this question helped me realize what, what it is and it's carve out time to sit down and just talk and get deep with some conversation. Yeah, and I think that that goes actually into one of the questions which I think is gonna be, um, not difficult, but it is conflict. It's a, it's complicated to kind of like provide the exact advice that you would need for this specifically specific question. But we're gonna definitely try. Um, how do you talk to your kids about HS in the groin, ages ten through fifteen? Um, I wanted to before I pass this off to just speak a little bit to what I would have wanted as an HS patient when I was young. Um, and then we can kind of go into the perspective of caregivers from that side. So um, as a teenager, I was thinking I was number one, disgusting, dirty. I was worrying about um, pus and blood and stuff like that, soaking my underwear. And then not only soaking my underwear, but going through my pants. I went through to a private school when I was uh, and when I got HS. So I, we had to wear skirts and we wore white shirts. So I had HS, like the wound, like I was gonna say wound juices. That's <laughs> that's not what they are. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the the pus and the blood was on my white clothing, and then also you know, anytime I took my underwear down, that's what I would see too. So I think coaching your, your, your teenager or your child through um, hygiene, what that, what they have is not an STD, providing space for them to just talk about it because there's a lot that goes on. At that time, I was jealous of my friends who got to go out and have dates and have sex and experience all of these different things that I felt like I was barred from. And so providing space for your kids to talk about that, 
um, even at a very young age, because even at 11 years old, that stuff was still around me, even if I was at a private school. Um, kids are introduced to things very early. So, um, you know, obviously gauge what you have, you want to talk about with your child as a parent. Um, but I feel like it's important to talk about the sex organs um, in a manner that is healing and helps them to understand what they're dealing with. Um, and then to help them to understand um, that they have space and room to talk about it, um, regardless of what comes up and then giving, providing them with a therapist um, and specifically possibly a sex therapist who works with children um, could possibly help as well um, so that they can talk to a professional that can help them to work through um, and understand what they're feeling, understand what's coming up because you can't articulate how you're feeling unless you understand how you're feeling, if that makes sense. Um, when I was that age, I, I, wouldn't, I wasn't able to tell my mom, I'm pissed that my friends are talking about dating. Well, no, I did express this, but I guess it was in, I was going through a lot at that time. So <laughs> it was in some different ways that I expressed that, but um, you know what I mean? Those are some of the ways that you know I, I, I tried to express that. So with that being said, um, I want to um, pass that over to, or actually one second, I have convinced, okay, so one anonymous attendee said, I had already convinced myself to never have sex until it would clear up, yeah, with HS, yeah. And that's, you know, personally, um, to I guess get really personal and open, that's how I feel personally now, because I deal with HS currently um, in those areas, um, and I have since I've had HS. Um, and so, um, it's, it's difficult, it's complex, and we are still trying to understand exactly how to work through this. But there are individuals that are out there that are specialists who help people to deal with the trauma, medical trauma, um, dealing with sex organs and just sex in general. I mean, it doesn't have to be necessarily to have sex, but it could just be to change your relationship to your private parts. Um, because now for me, for an example, I don't, I don't have a good relationship with, with my body parts. And so I know a lot of HS patients feel the same way. And it's about rebuilding that relationship and it takes time and it's going to be painful, <laughs> it really is. However, it's worth it because you can then on the other side of that is the freedom that you seek of wanting to have a relationship, wanting to you know, cultivate a space where you can talk about what you're going through with your significant other, even at a young age, um, being able to have that voice, I think is important. I think, you know, is a part of what my organization wants to do is provide tools for teenagers and children with HS to, to use their voice um, to articulate their experience. So I want to segue off to passing that off to um, Anaya Muriel to, to speak in, um, uh, one of you can uh, can speak to that, whichever one wants to go first. <laughs> I'm bursting a little bit on this one. Um, so I, I, one thing that I would do differently because at the time it was developing or did develop or was, was getting worse, when it first came, there wasn't a conversation. We didn't have conversations about, um, about your body and what, you know, you know, on that level in general. And so looking back in hindsight, I think it is important for parents to keep uh, an open uh, communication, not just open, but actually have communication about, not just about, um, you know, sex education, but actually about um, how to be healthy or, you know, and just to talk about things as, as as if they're normal like you know we have we have all these we have our arm we have we have all these parts to our body and so i think uh, a lot younger i would have started having conversations where it felt more natural and comfortable to be able to talk about your body and i think that had that communication been you know a line there that i would have found out as opposed to uh um a physical, you know, at a physical fi finding out that this was, this is what was going on. Or maybe my child would explain in more detail that this has been happening in a long time and this is what it looks like, et cetera. So I would have, I would do that differently. And I would encourage all parents to not act like it's so taboo 
Um, otherwise, the child is not going to talk about these personal things like that. Um, and then when you talk about the relation, you know, relationships and dating, um, and so I'm, I'm teaching my child um, to, uh, to to abstain and to wait till marriage. Um, but I know, and it's something I may. Well, I can't say for sure because I don't know if my child, you know, thinks like I think, but I think about the long term um, co- uh, effects of how that could impact a, a future relationship and ultimately a marriage. And it also makes me think that I can encourage even more. That's why my child needs to be very selective before deciding who they want to enter into an intimate, you know, even and when I say intimate, I mean, getting so emotionally and spiritually attached to someone that you're so attached and you don't know if you're, this is the person, the person or a person that could provide the support that you need on that level when you're looking at spending your life with this person. Um, And so I think that um, we can have conversations about, be very um, discerning about attaching yourself to someone and you don't know if this person is capable of, of, of supporting you emotionally, mentally, physically, tangibly, you know, some of the things that, that I may be doing as a parent that may be needed in the marriage to support each other, you know, with food choices and, and all of that kind of thing. So, um, so that's all I'll say about that. And before I pass it off to Muriel, I just want to like say on the aspects of relationships and dating with HS, um, For the longest, I thought I didn't have options because I was like, I have this chronic illness condition and skin condition, and I feel like I should just take whatever I can get. That is the most toxic thing that you could ever think because you deserve way more than that. I have been, I've seen my parents love each other through some very, very difficult chronic illnesses, and they've shown up for each other and it's been hard, but they've been there and it exists. So you write down what you want in a partner and you put that in front of you, your face and you keep that in front of you so that you know what you you want. And so when somebody doesn't meet that, you're not saying, oh, maybe I can just pass that off because you don't want to be in a relationship. I just want to boo. But the second that you do that and you open up that boundary that you set, somebody does something where you're just like, okay, I should have just kept the boundary that I had in place. And so um, I just wanted to add that little piece because I know that sometimes with dating with HS, it can be difficult. It feels difficult, Um, but you are not number one, obligated to be in a relationship. And number two, you are not obligated to disclose even to someone that you are not sexually intimate with or you're just dating casually that you have a chronic illness. gauge it. You know what I mean? They don't have to know that information, especially if this is the first or second or third date. You know what I mean? If this is somebody that you're dating for years, months, something like that, and it's getting serious, you know, maybe you want to talk about it. That's up to you. You don't even have to. But in the earlier stages, save yourself from the the pain of, of that, because it's not necessary to have their acceptance at that time. You know what I mean? Um, and I know that's difficult, Uh, And that takes a lot of emotional work, but that's a part of the healing with HS. So I want to pass this off to Muriel, who can speak to her and uh, give her opinion on this aspect. I I think you're still muted. Um, so while they're fixing that, I want to go to, so clarifying some of the, com- the, the comment from last time. Um, so they were asking, um, as a parent with HS, talking to your kids about what you are dealing with, um, which is, I think that's a good topic too, but um, I see that you know, Muriel's mic is working. So I want her to speak to this, uh, the, the topic we had previously before we move into this next question. Okay, I apologize for that. I did something with my cursor and the whole screen moved away. I was like, oh no. Um, so uh, I, I really want to say that our name really covered it. That's, that was um, perfect information. Um, 
uh, this is probably one of, one of those times where I probably say, should say I'm sorry, <laughs> because I really wasn't cognizant of all of that, so much of that until much later. Uh, so I really, I really didn't have it. I wasn't, I, I was dealing with certain parts of it, but, you know, as we are going through this, you know, continuously and forever, you know, hopefully not forever, but um, as we're going through this, I'm learning things and I'm learning them, you know, now and I'm learning them in the last four years. And so I didn't really know how to address some of those things. I did, I do remember talking to you about, you know, loving yourself and it being okay and, you know, those kind of things. But uh, I just didn't quite know how to address it all because um, HS was just, it was so new and, and we were just trying to figure out, you know, where we're going to go as far as taking care of it was concerned. But our needs really said a lot that was good. I agree with her 100%. Absolutely. And moving into the, the question about speaking as a parent with HS to your kids, um, I don't have any kids, so it's difficult for me to um, provide any like advice for that, but I, I would almost honestly say, I don't know, I could probably say that if I had kids, I would definitely like sit down with them and kind of like try to break it down as, you know, to, you know, the most simplest form, use like diagrams and like animations, there are things online, there are people like Hydraware, they post really good statistics, um, KS and HS on um, Instagram also posts very good statistics. They can be, it's a lot of information, but these are good ways to kind of break down a lot of what you're dealing with so that your children can understand um, also like uh, what you're facing as, as a parent with a chronic illness. Um, I don't know if Muriel, Muriel or Ane can provide any advice for that because I mean, you all don't have HS, um, but I don't, I, I don't know if you want to speak to that. Uh, can you repeat? I was I was reading a question in the chat when you mm -hmm. said specifically what we would be responding to. Um, yeah, so they were asking about um, showing up. Well, asking like telling your kids about having HS. So oh. what, what is that? Do you have any advice for that? I, I'm sorry. I actually was. That's what I was typing. <laughs> Um, uh, Jason had asked that question. Th this is what I typed. I said, Jason, I would share specific details about your condition, the actual medical condition, the medical, um, you know, um, when you look up the medical condition and read about it, help them understand, you know, the basic understanding of what it is. And then depending on the age, you can go deeper or, or even less specific about the actual wounds, depending on what you think they may be able to handle, depending on their age. Uh, but I would be honest, it doesn't need to be a secret. Um, it, it can help them learn empathy. Um, but I also, uh, also, but also share that this is something that's not disclosed to everyone. That you, it, you know, that it's um, that you only share it with the people that you choose to share it with. And so you're asking them to also respect that, not to share it with other people as well. And that would be up to you if you want to share it with other people. Um, Absolutely. Muriel, did you want to add anything? Uh, not really. That was that was perfect. That was perfect. Absolutely. Um, so I wanted to move to another question. I'm going back up because there was some hidden. Um, so uh, Angie was asking, do you think school nurses know anything about HS or know how to help kids in school who may have symptoms while in school? I feel like they are an important part of the caregiving umbrella for young people and teens. Um, I, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, so far removed from school <laughs> um, at this point. Um, but uh, um, Ane, do you, would you be able to speak to that? Because um, I don't know if you've had any interactions. Um, so my child is homeschooled. So we didn't deal with the public school, but we still deal with other um, other adults and other um, social situations of you know homeschool groups and and co-ops and things like that and there wasn't as there was a point 
uh, where my child had surgery and that was during, you know, at the, the height of school. Um, when I speak to the nurses specifically, I don't think that they're gonna know. I don't think that they're gonna be able to provide the support that, that the child needs. But I think that's a perfect opportunity to educate. Um, and so when I connect that to my child's situation, um, I didn't have anyone outside of me that was helping provide that direct like wound care or, you know, if you need to go to the nurse's office or things like that. So we didn't deal with that aspect. But if there was a nurse involved or someone that was in that position, then I would have educated them a little bit and then say, OK, well, maybe we can we can leave some, um, you know, some supplies in. Or, or maybe the child leaves the supplies in their locker or, or their backpack or whatever, but they might need to go to the nurse to, uh, so that they can provide a space that they can do wound care or something. So to, to bring that nurse as a, um, a support person on that level, they're gonna need some education. I would not automatically assume that they will understand or be able to provide what's needed. Mm -hmm. So, um, but in our situation, uh, where there was just people who saw, you know, there was some walking differently and my child said, well, you know, some, something's going on with my leg or I have to have this procedure, my leg, you know, and kind of said it like that. And we didn't have to go into any more detail. Mm -hmm. I think this is a great segue into this next question, which is um, asked, talking about, um, so, so someone asked, do the speakers have any tips on how to be that vocal advocate if being outspoken is uncomfortable, which I think is great because not everyone has a voice uh, or I'm not gonna say has a voice, but um, everyone has a voice, <laughs> but not everybody um, would like to utilize that voice in the capacity um, of, I don't know, speaking out sometimes. So are there other ways to, um, to be a, a vocal advocate for, for HS patients? that you could provide. Um, Anae or Muriel, you can speak to to that. If you're, if you're asking uh, being an advocate when you're talking to the physicians, is that what we're? Um, yeah. Okay, so I, I worked in healthcare um, for a long time on the insurance side. I know that physicians have gone to school and they feel that they know, but they'll they'll tell you that um, when they say practicing physicians, they are practicing a lot of things because they are trying to find things out just like you are. But some of them are um, resistant <laughs> when you're asking questions um, because they are thinking, well, I know I'm the doctor and you're the patient, that's why you're here. So what I do is ask questions in a way that's respectful, but to let them know, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing about this, I'm thinking about this, you know, what, is, what do you think about that? Uh, so that it's not um, like I'm, I'm, you know, coming at them on the, or on the front or anything like that. So that's what I think, uh, be respectful, ask your questions, gather your information, um, read before you ask the question so that you're getting some knowledge about you know, whatever it is that you wanna ask. And then you have to take that information that the doctor's giving you, information that, that you are um, actually studying and, and like Jasmine said, from, from reputable sources and also listening to um, the HS patient. You have to put all of those together and, and then you have to make a decision moving forward what you're going to do or, or how you're going to handle things. So uh, I think that's, that's one of the things that, that I do that, that's helpful in, um, you know, being an advocate. Mm -hmm. you know, I've missed a couple of things that I wish I hadn't um, because I wasn't there. You know, uh, I usually would go with, with my daughter to, to appointments. There were a couple that I didn't go to that I feel like if I had gone to, I would have caught a couple of things, you know, that that um, didn't go the way we planned. But uh, yeah, but, you know, ask the questions in a respectful manner and um, gather your information from all of those sources. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, there is another question 
Um, how can we express to our partner, caregiver, better our needs to help them understand um, as it can be hard to express in tough moments? Also, what are ways we can make sure we are not ignoring their self-care needs? Um, I think I would love to say that um, a lot of, I think a lot of like showing up or asking for or expressing to your partner, your caregiver is um, sort of like what I was saying before, like speaking about specifics. So, um, I know it can be hard to kind of tune in, um, especially when you're in debilitating pain like HS, it can be really hard to focus and that's not an exaggeration, it's literal. Like it can be very difficult to focus because you're angry, you're sad, you're emotional. There's so much going on in your body. Um, it could be, and then sometimes it's the caregiver and the partner just having enough awareness to kind of like see what might help. So even if that patient can't articulate, it's like, oh, they're uncomfortable. Maybe they need a cushion. Like maybe they need some icy hot. Maybe they need gauze. Maybe they need a buffer between, you know, if you have a, a boil on your chest, maybe you need some gauze so that, you know, the boil's not touching your skin and it's not hurting. Maybe they need painkillers. You know what I mean? It's kind of like a part of it too is thinking through it, you know? Um, but the articulation part comes in where you um, just try your best to pinpoint one thing that you would need and then that might that might uh, help you to figure out what else to ask for um, in that moment. And sometimes it might happen later on when you're settled. So give yourself time as well to, to calm down as much as you possibly can emotionally, physically, like breathe, like breathing, like I'm not saying that as some kooky thing, like breathing literally helps to get rid of pain. <laughs> it helps to manage it. Like, I'm not saying that it's a painkiller, like it'll go away, but if you breathe through it, you're not tensing up. And so you're not, you know, you're not holding that emotion. You're not holding that pain. You're letting it go as much as possible as you're kind of like moving. I know it's difficult. Like, trust me, I know. Um, but I think those are some of the, the ways that I would, I would say that. Um, cause breathing, like Lisa said, is extremely like, it's extremely healing. Um, and uh, it's not one of those things where like, you know, uh, it's a solution to getting medical advice or anything like that. It's just a supplement for those moments where you need to kind of calm down and articulate what you, what you need. Because I know that it's been difficult for me to tell my mother or my father or anybody, my friends, how they can show up when I'm emotionally distressed. Um, because I can't think straight. So try to calm yourself down as much as possible and then, you know, sit, relax, get situated and articulate if you can. If you can't, try your best to just say what you, the first thing that you need off the top of your head, even if it's some water, just be like, I need water right now. And then send that person to go get that, you know? Um, and then that might help you to kind of gather yourself. So I don't know if Anae and Muriel, if you have any advice on this specifically on um, patients talking about uh, their needs to their caregivers and partners um, when it can be hard to express, especially when they're in, in pain or in those tough moments. Um, one of the things that that uh, particular uh, I don't know if that was that question or the next one, um, the one dealing with uh, helping the parents understand, is that a separate question? Uh, how, uh, maybe it's the, them helping their parents understand. Um, uh, what question before this or the current question? I was just, uh, maybe I was mixing those together in my mind. Yeah, I think- Okay, so. helping, the, okay. Yeah. Okay, how can we express to our caregiver Okay, I, I would suggest, um, it, it sounds so simple or it sounds so formal, but to literally, again, like I mentioned earlier, to literally carve time, um, to just mention things on the fly, like, oh, like you didn't get me any, any organic broccoli and salmon, you know, that's what I eat, you know, you know, after they've gone grocery shopping, that, that's not the best way to communicate your needs. Like, let's sit down and make a meal plan. Let's sit down and make a grocery list. Let's do this together. Um, one of the things, for example, so, so communication, um, how can we communicate? over communicate, um, don't under communicate and then expect the uh, caregiver um, or the partner to 
know or remember what you told them, you know, a year ago that you needed. So one example of what we did was we would go and on Kroger's and check off all the things, make a grocery, not a grocery list, but a grocery, I guess it's like a saved list or something. And it's all the things that possibly could be um, purchased that were okay on the AIP that I also knew that my child ate. So that was a way to communicate without having to continually communicate back and forth and try to remember. Um, my child began to start a grocery list. So we were out of some things um, that are on the AIP food plan or whatever, then it's put on the list on the refrigerator. So I would say over communicate, don't just assume and don't communicate on the fly or in frustration uh, because something didn't happen. You can carve time once a week and say, let's, let's touch, let's have a, let's have a family meeting or let's have a, you know, let's have a meeting once a week and kind of check in with each other and I can let you know what I need or, you know, maybe how I'm feeling unsupported or how I am feeling supported. Don't just communicate what wasn't done, but communicate how you appreciate the things that were done. Because even in that psychology of someone feeling needed and feeling like what they did was appreciated is important too that back and forth. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We have two more questions. Or uh, Muriel, did you want to dive into this? I think that she, that uh, Arne said that very well. That was good. Um, I want to dive into, we have two more questions before we wrap up for today. Um, the next question comes from JT. As a parent of a child with HS, what are all the actions you take to make yourself more aware of this condition? I, I've asked uh, my parents to educate themselves by sending them info, informing um, them about my experience and showing them what happens, but they tend to get distracted and not look into things on their own time until something happens with me. I want them to be as involved as I am with learning more about this condition. Yeah, that's, um, I think all you can tell a caregiver is that you want them to learn more about it, um, about HS. And I, I'm gonna go back to Arne when she was saying over communicate. So, if you are explaining, not just that I want you to learn about HS because I'm going through something, but communicating more of what you feel, where you are. Um, I used to talk to uh, patients that would call um, and when I was working um, in healthcare. And they would say, well, I didn't get an appointment um, at the time that I needed. I said, well, what did you tell the nurse? Uh, or what did you tell the attendant? Um, well, that my leg hurt. I said, oh, that's why you got an appointment five days out. You need to tell them you're cut. I'm swollen. I'm bleeding. My leg's hurting. You have to give them more detail. So over communicating is really giving all the information. And like I said earlier, when Jasmine told me about how she felt every moment of every day, every time she did a function that I would never think about HS um, because I don't have it, but I would never think it. And I wasn't thinking that she was thinking it. I just thought she was you know, going about her business and doing what she does and that she has HS and that she wasn't having these emotional you know, feelings about it all the time. So expressing more of what you're going through, because again, if a person doesn't have a chronic illness that you have, they cannot relate. They think they are. I mean, I still don't know what Jasmine goes through. I still don't know. I, I just have a better understanding, but you don't know. You just don't know. And so that means they don't know. And you have to kind of give them um, a little slack on that, that these people don't know because they don't have HS. So how can I help them to understand what I'm going through? And once they get that part, they'll start doing more. But um, don't just count them out because they're, they're not able to relate. I've had conditions people 
they, they, they couldn't understand. My husband's had conditions people couldn't understand. They just kind of shake their head and say, okay, wow, ooh, that's a lot. And they keep moving because they don't know the depth of the pain, um, the depth of what's happening to you, they don't know. Um, but that's what I would say. Say as much as you can say about how you feel, how your life is, what this has been you know, to you in your life. And then hopefully they'll go and get more information um, or read the information that you've actually given them because yeah, that's, that's an important piece. You should educate yourself as a, as a caregiver so that you are able to communicate with um, the patient. And before I pass it to Ane, I wanted to say um, that education takes time. Um, that I have had instances with my mom and my parents that I've had to coach them through and it's taken years. And I mean, it, it can be emotionally taxing, like, but if you care about them wanting to understand, like getting them to understand, um, it's a labor of love in some aspects because I feel, I don't wanna be alone. And I know that my parents don't want me to feel alone either. So it's like, I know that they want to know. It's just that it might take some time for them to seriously understand what you're going through. So, you know, if it's not working immediately, don't give up, I would say. Um, just continue like feeding that information because, you know, I've, re I've, uh, <laughs> I've reprogrammed my parents in some ways <laughs> by doing that. So it's taken some time, but it's, but we're in a space where we can talk about things and we can, um, and where they're educated. And um, when I share information with them, you know, they, they're interested, you know, they're uh, finding out more information and things like that. So um, with that being said, I want to provide the space for Anae to say, uh, to, to give her opinion about this aspect as well. Yeah, I feel a little um, passionate about this. Um, first of all, I would say that no one grandparents, no one is going to uh, give the level and quality and commitment and time that you as the parent. And I don't think that they should, um, you know, that, that, that's your, you know, that's your child. And so don't, first of all, expect anyone else to be at that same level. So I think there, there's one, the expectation. However, um, they aren't gonna do as much research as you and they aren't gonna know as much as you. And so like Jasmine said, there is the continual re-education. So if that means the child is going to stay for the weekend, they can't have any door, dairy or you know, whatever it is that you, so you, you send the list, you, know, you put it on a piece of paper and you, and you send it every single time until they get to the point where you don't have to do it anymore. And so just know that um, even though it's a pain and even though it's monotonous, just don't feel like you're overburdened because um, no one is going to provide or understand or, and all of that at the level that you do. Um, but another example or another suggestion that I have to help educate them more, uh, more deeply um, to better understand is to say, um, can we meet at five o'clock on Zoom on, you know, on Saturday or you know, what time do you have, a, have 45 minutes free? I wanna show you this video and um, just give you some more information and talk about um, the care that, you know, that your grandchild needs, whoever that happens to be, and approach them from that emotional aspect and ask them to commit a, a, a set amount of time and actually get into it as opposed to here, read this, here, read that. I think that's easy for, for anyone to get distracted. Uh, so you almost like direct their attention and carve out time to specifically um, uh, share the information and talk about it. Absolutely. Um, another attendee asked, um, this disease is so, well, they said, is, this disease is so frustrating and my child understandably loses their temper. How do we need, navigate not taking things personally while still demanding respect and communication in an effective way? And before I pass this off, I just wanted to say, um, as a child, I was not good at this. And my parents had to navigate a lot of BS <laughs> from me. <laughs> Um, and one day I'll share that portion of my life, I'm not ready, but um, 
one of the things um, I would say is just, just being understanding um, because in, in looking at the situation, um, if that child is dealing with a boil or an open wound, it's like that inflammation is causing emotional distress. Um, scientifically, that it cause, inflammation causes emotional distress. Um, so when we keep that in mind, we can say, okay, this is about this, not about me. You know what I mean? And when we can think in that manner, then I think that we separate ourselves from the, um, the direction of the emotion and we focus on why the emotion is showing up. And then, then you can attack or you can deal with, that's a better word, deal with um, what they're experiencing and talk them through it. And sometimes people don't want to talk. They're just like, I'm upset and I want to be upset. And it's like, okay, you can be upset over there. You know what I mean? So sometimes you have to tell your child, like, you know, I let's, how about we create this space or let's create, let's do something um, or create a corner, uh, a moment, a room or something that, that they can go into and maybe be alone um, by themselves to deal with the emotions or to just get away from everything and to relax or, you know what I mean? Something to help them to, to deal with what's going on. Um, so that, that's what I would say from my perspective, but I wanna pass this off to um, Muriel and Anae because I know you all have a lot of experience. <laughs> So, uh, uh, Anae, if you want to take this uh, first. Okay, um, you, you, you made some good, awesome points, not being a parent. They're, they're awesome. Um, and I am reminded that, you know, as a parent, we're thinking, okay, there's a certain level of respect that we demand, and we're thinking about this on a regular basis. Um, but when we think about if we've had a rough day at work or someone, you know, almost ran us off the road and we just got home or, you know, like we bring our own emotions and our own stress into our parenting and how, how different should we not expect someone less developed and less mature to do the same thing uh, and to bring that into the relationship. So um, this conversation of just being reminded that our our children are people, they're humans, um, and that everything is not personal to us. But um, I have been gu absolutely guilty of that. But uh, when I shared earlier that my child said, okay, I'm dealing with this and this and this and this, the only way that that was able to come out was for me to, uh, that I stayed calm in that situation. And I saw emotions and I tried to pull it out and say, you know, what's going on? And my child said, well, can I, can we just end this conversation? So I knew it was something deeper. So paying attention to the emotion and not just the action uh, of the emotion or the tone of voice from the emotion, but try to dig deeper and ask, where is that, where is that coming from? Um, but I, even what I mentioned earlier about providing opportunities for self-care for the child, um, that helps get some of the stress out so that it doesn't keep you know, building up so much that you have this so often. So um, it is important to provide that child outlets. If they have a lot of, it, uh, act, you know, energy, make sure they get to go to the whatever, you know, to jump around or whatever. So be proactive also, not just reactive. Mm -hmm. Miriam? Uh, I 100% I agree with that. Um, I would say that if, your child is, um, well, sometimes people um, are distressed about one thing and they're acting out someplace else. Sometimes it's hard to bring those two together because you're looking at one area and they're in the HS areas. Like I'm, I'm going through with the HS, but you know, I'm mad about this. And so um, I, I would really think, you know, try to talk with um, your HS patient or your child, uh, let them know that, look, I'm, I'm here for you. Tell me what's really bothering you or tell me what is, what is happening with you or, you know, is there anything that I need to know? Is, is, are you having a flare or is, you know, and, and try to get them to tell you what really is going on instead of um, overreacting because they're upset. Um, and, and, you know, keeping the respect level, you know, good, you know, once we, once we get that under control, you know, you can't call me out of my name and those kind of things, <laughs> but let's talk. I'm here to talk with you. I'm here to listen. Tell me what's going on. Tell me how you're feeling. What's, what's happening. 
you know, and maybe they can tell you some things and maybe they can tell you, you know, just a little bit and they might tell you what you need to know, but at least get those clues so that when there's a calmer moment, you can come back and say, okay, honey, so what was, what was going on? How are you feeling? What's, what's, what was happening? And then maybe you can get the, the real picture of what they're going through and, and what they're feeling. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's very difficult for a lot of people to express emotions when they're, they're feeling overwhelmed. So, you know, young people go through that as well as adults. And I wanted to add, um, before we wrap up, um, that providing space does not mean accepting disrespect. So I just want to emphasize that because you can provide space for someone and still set a boundary, um, sort of what Muriel was saying, which is saying, hey, I, it's okay for you to express your feelings, but what's not okay is for you to disrespect me and to call me out my name or to curse at me or to you know, to X, Y, and Z, whatever the stipulations are for your own household is important to make sure that you enforce, but in a loving way, you know what I mean? Because boundaries are important, even for parents in relation to their kids and vice versa. So um, being open to those boundaries and enforcing those boundaries, I think can help. The last question that I have, and I always want to end these on a positive note, what is the hope that you have for the HF community as a caregiver um, moving forward in the future. Um, Muriel, you can take this question first. So my hope is that with HS advocates um, like you and, and others and or other organizations that we see more and more people finding out what the cause of HS is, how to um, treat it and eventually how to cure it. There have been you know, conditions where they never thought there would be a cure and there, and there was a cure. So I don't believe that there isn't a cure for this. Um, so I, I am hopeful, very hopeful. I've watched almost no information about HS to, I can go out now and put HS, just put HS and all this information is popping up. So people are, are really trying to understand what's going on because it's affecting, or we're, we're finding out that it's affecting more and more people. Um, one of the things that I think is wonderful and very special is I watched Jasmine go from keeping this undercover. Don't tell anybody, don't talk about it. I don't know how people are gonna respond. I don't want to deal with this to going to the other side. And I watched her do it. It was very, very difficult to, to put um, herself out and say, okay, I have this and wanting to help other people. And then folks just started coming from all places saying, oh, well, I have that, I have that. And there was such a relief for them because she stepped out to say, you know, I have this and I have to tell my story. So I wanna encourage HS patients to, in, in your it's, it's safe environments, you know, as slowly as you need to, but to share your story, to say, you know, where you are, what you have, and, and know that you have a community of people that care about you and um, care about what happens in the future. And so I'm excited because I, I just really believe that there will be a cure and I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Beautiful, Anne? Well, I think that the experience, not only the mistakes, but the wins, the positive gains that has happened as a result of our experience and seeing improvement and seeing things that worked and helped from, um, from stage three to, um, you know, to, to where we are now in this process. It's such a dramatic um, change in the journey from feeling uh, so overwhelmed and not knowing what to do to now having a flow of, okay, we know we're doing this and do this and to take that information and to share it with other people. And ideally, I would like to see my child become, you know, more of an advocate. Um, but at the same time, I'm okay if that never happens because I am empowered and I have learned and I am sharing and even do so in the groups on Facebook and things like that. And so I see the power in that, even with me not having HS myself. Um, and so, um, 
just to continue to heal and to stay on the course and uh, for my child to have self-love regardless of anything that's not perfect, but yet, even if it's not be an advocate for HS, be an advocate for uh, health and wellness and uh, learning how to heal yourself however you need to. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Miro and Ane, for providing your time, your talents, your knowledge on caregiving for HS. This has been an extremely beautiful conversation. Um, I think it's very healing. Um, and this is a topic that I think that needs to be covered a little bit more in the HS community. So that's why I wanted to provide space um, because I know there are a lot of individuals who are getting HS, but they don't have support. So we need to build that support community as well as be, uh, while we're bringing awareness to HS um, at the same time. Um, thank you so much everyone for attending. Thank you to our panelists. This was such a great and potent conversation about caregiving with HS. Uh, we are continuing the conversation tomorrow for day five of the HS Awareness Virtual Summit. And tomorrow we have uh, some special guests because we will be talking about, um, actually not special guests, it's my, it's, this one is mine. Um, this is telling your story with HS. So I will be talking about, um, talking about and being an advocate and how to do things like make documentaries, write articles and things of that nature about HS. So if you're curious about storytelling, um, specifically for HS and you are interested in doing that for yourself or just curious about what that process is like, tune in tomorrow, 7 p.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time, 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And that is telling your story with HS and that is with yours truly. So tune in for that. And of course, we're gonna have prizes um, as well for that day too. So I will see you.